Jesus Christ. Why? Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, of God. For it is the power of God into salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. How many Greeks are out here today? If you're not, that means you're a Jew, right? Okay, there's only a Jew or a Greek, a kind of Gentile. And so um, keep that in mind. Take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll get there momentarily. The Virginia le legislative uh, session for 2024 is uh, dealing with uh, a lot of bills as they normally do. Uh, I don't know if you've been keeping up with the news. One of the uh, bills that they're dealing with right now is with gambling. Uh, the House Bill 590 and the Senate version, the Senate Bill 212, is a gambling bill adding 90,000 gambling machines in Virginia. Most of these are going to be in places where they will be unsupervised, and uh, uh, so needless to say, the opportunity for people to be involved that probably should not be uh, is going to be greatly, um, very high. It passed, uh, the House bill passed the House of Delegates 65 to 34. All 51 of the Democrats voted for it, and, uh, and sorry to say, there were 14 Republicans that voted for it. Uh, but also the Senate bill passed in the Senate um, 
With 14 Republicans voting for it, it makes it more difficult for Governor Youngkin to veto this. And so it's a very serious situation. At the same time, this past week, two news outlets reported about, first of all, the Super Bowl that said that it was held in Las Vegas, and I quote, it was a fitting venue given the prominent role gambling plays in sports. And uh, gambling is becoming more and more prevalent in sports. Uh, sports betting has left the shadows and now it can be found on anybody's phone personally. Uh, there are a lot of people that just vote, that, I mean, vote, that just bet, uh, make bets and so forth right on their phone and it continues to go and it's becoming more and more prevalent. Even before the Super Bowl, it was said that it was expected that 68 million people would bet $23 billion. That blows my mind. I mean, it blew my mind enough to hear about what some of the seats in the stadium were going for. But to think that 68 million would bet $23 billion around the Super Bowl, and only half of it, they said, was about the outcome of the game. The other half would have been on what they call side bets. These sides, side bets, they said, would be things like, how many field goals will be attempted? Not made or by either, just how many is going to be attempted in the game? Get this one. They'll bet on what color will the Gatorade be that's poured out on the winning coach. <laughs> and this is even worse. What color lipstick will Taylor Swift be wearing? <laughs> Red or something else? In New Jersey, since betting was legalized, calls to the gambling helpline tripled. All right, these are the ones that recognize they need help. How many that, whether they recognize it or don't, will not even ask for it? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this is not just an addiction that has gotten out of hand. Uh, this betting, this gambling, is a major problem that is destroying lives and unfortunately destroying homes and people are affected. My question is how many Christians, how many Christians are involved and, and think nothing of it? Uh, today I want us to look at this subject. Why is gambling a, a big deal? Uh, what does God say about it? I've entitled the message, What's Wrong with Gambling? Father, I pray that as we look into your word and see your principles, that we would understand where you stand about this particular subject. Help us to <clears throat> see our need to be supportive uh, uh, to those that are trying to not be involved in gambling. While it may be addictive, while it may be a habit that is hard to kick, I pray like any habit that you would help them and that they would get the help that is necessary. Lord, help us to understand what you say, what I pray even more so that we would seek to please you and not just ourselves with the decisions we make. For us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Why should Christians be opposed to gambling? Well, the number one reason, as we're going to see, is it violates several principles of God. And the first one that I want to look at is that gambling violates God's stewardship principle. Now, what is stewardship uh, in the first place? Uh, the word stewardship is a combination of two Greek words, house and govern. And it has to do then with one managing the affairs of another's household or another's possessions. Uh, it was the servant's responsibility as they would be chosen. Joseph in the Old Testament was an example of that in Potiphar's house how that he was given this stewardship of everything that Potiphar owned. And he was to manage it for his master. <clears throat> and so a steward is one that has uh, uh, a responsibility to manage that which has been entrusted into their care. Entrusted by another that maintains the ownership 
and is also one in which we are accountable to give uh, uh, an answer for how we manage that which has been put into our trust. And so the ownership was still by the master and the accountability was still to the master. One of the most familiar verses in scripture dealing with stewardship is 1 Corinthians 4, 2, where it says it is required of stewards that a man be found what? Faithful. Faithful. We're knowing that, we've heard that, and as stewards, <clears throat> we need to be found faithful. So the next question is, who is a steward? How many stewards do we have here today? I didn't say stewards. <laughs> okay. Uh, stewards, every one of us. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, I'm going to say number one, then you have been given something to possess, and that's called eternal life. Okay. Number one, you've been given eternal life. We're stewards of that. <clears throat> Secondly, if as a believer, the Lord tells us that he has given through the Holy Spirit, every one of us, at least one spiritual gift. We have a spiritual gift or spiritual gifts that he has imparted unto us. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 4.10, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God's grace, his gift unto us that is good, that we don't deserve, is the spiritual gifts, and we are stewards of these spiritual gifts to use them in a way that he would be pleased. So let me ask you, as a believer today, what is your spiritual gift? Not only should you know what your spiritual gift is, but are you seeking to use that spiritual gift in the local church? That's where he intends. That's what he has given you responsibility to. And we are to be actively involved in that. And so many of us, have been giving uh, things from God, uh, whether spiritual gifts, uh, just salvation, all of these things in a wider response. Uh, uh, matter of fact, everything that we have in this life has been given to us by God. In James chapter 1, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. He has given us everything, every good gift, every perfect gift is from him. As I ask you to turn here to 1 Corinthians 6, the last two verses tells us that even our bodies that we have been given do not belong to us, they belong to God. What, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? It's not your body. It's not my body. It's his body that he is in. We are bought with a price, he goes on to say. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We belong to God. My body and your body, it belongs to God. We are stewards of that body, and we're going to be held accountable for what we do with God's body that he has given us. Just because God gives us something doesn't mean it's ours to do with as we please. We are stewards of all that God gives us. So the key part of being a good steward is recognizing that what we have is from God and belongs to God. That never ceases. Specifically, we look at stewardship and we can see how that it, it covers a great deal of things in our lives. Our home. Do, do you have a home? Yes, I have a home. You know, the... The bank tells me I own it. But you know, I don't own it. God does. It's his home. He gave me the, the opportunity to be able to purchase it with money that he gave me. All of it is his. And we recognize that our car, I've said many times, you know, when we look at our car, uh, is it my car? Is it my truck? If God needs it, is it available? We've had missionaries that have come, not more of evangelists that have come that have taken advantage of this, that had maybe a, 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 somebody traveling with them that needed a vehicle. And, um, okay, 
you can have one of mine to, to drive around and use while you're here because it's not mine, it's God's. And if he has need for it, just like the donkey on the, the road there that uh, Jesus said, go find him and say, you know, the master hath need of him. The Lord hath need of him. That word Lord is the word owner. And he is Lord of everything. And so <clears throat> we have our home. We have a car. Our clothes. Uh, some people really get into a lot of clothes. Some people don't care. <laughs> it's obvious. No, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Our gadgets. How many of you got gadgets out there? <laughs> we all have our gadgets. All of these things would come into the play as just saying our possessions. Our possessions, we are stewardship of them. That includes our money that buys those possessions. And that's where gambling comes into play. It's been said, and I believe this to be true, uh, it's been said that the surest way to determine what a person's priorities are is to look at his checkbook. Now, that's a little outdated because some of you don't even know what a checkbook is. <laughs> and some of us even have gotten to the point where we write very few checks. And so we would have to say, you know, when you look into your credit card statement or whatever record of, of your use of money is, uh, if you look at that, it will be a reflection of what is important to you. And so we can evaluate a little bit of, of how we spend our money, how we spend, how we go. God's money uh, on the things that he is pleased with or the things just that I am pleased with or you. Um, since God not only is concerned with us having money and he does provide that for us, but he will one day judge us for how we use it, I would think it would be important for us to understand his principles of use. What comes into play? There are four things real quick here that I'm just going to make as statements. Number one, God is concerned with how and where you use his money. He is concerned. Not only that, God has instructions about how and where you should use his money. And I'm not just talking about giving tithes and offerings this morning for sure. God promises blessings if we use his money properly. And God promises punishment if we use his money improperly. And so again, it's quite important for us to understand what it is that he wants us to do and what we should be very weary of and, and careful about. If we don't, uh, Ecclesiastes 5.13 says, There is a sore evil, there is a great evil, which I have seen under the sun, namely, riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. To the owners thereof. That would be us that we think that we own it. And when God wants us to use our money a certain way, if we keep it and hold on to it and just use it for what we want instead of what God says or indicates, then it can be to our hurt. There can be punishment. <clears throat> Gambling is not using God's money properly, and therefore it violates God's stewardship principle. It is using money in a greedy fashion. You know, most people that, that gamble, <clears throat> as I'll, I may say again, you've heard... Um, a bird in hand is worth two in a bush. They're willing to, to they're willing to take the bird in hand and take a chance in order to get an opportunity maybe for two in the bush. Let me tell you something doesn't always work. A lottery, for instance. Uh, you don't see too many rich people playing the lottery. You see poor people playing the lottery. Because they have it in mind, somehow I might get lucky. <laughs> have you ever thought about where all that money comes from? It comes from poor people's pockets. They don't give away more money than they take in. They take in a lot more money than they give away. 
That's why they do it. And let me tell you something. The people that do that, when they try to get permission to do it, and when they did in the past, and say, we'll be able to donate and so forth to our school systems and, and help out with our taxes and hogwash. Doesn't work that way. Empty promises. And the same thing is true when the devil whispers in a person's ear and says, hey, you ought to try that. It's only a dollar or two. Go ahead and get five. It'll increase your, your odds. Greed of what it can get us. Second principle that it violates is God's love principle. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. This past Wednesday night, Wednesday was Valentine's Day. We had some leftover love songs this morning. Did y'all catch the theme of what you were singing about? Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how he loves you and me. Uh, several others there that had love in it in the verses. <coughs> I preached a message Wednesday night dealing with the importance and the command that we are having to love. Jesus said in Matthew 22 that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. We're to love our neighbor as ourself. Uh, certainly he gives the importance of that. We talked about the main hindrance uh, to our loving God properly and our loving others properly is sin and and uh, in these last days, Paul told young Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2, that men shall be lovers of their own selves. You know that one of the things that fights against us loving God and loving others is selfishness, loving ourself. And the same thing is true with listening to what God says. We're sometimes not as uh, motivated to choose to please God as we are to choose to please ourselves. And that is just as much a sin as any other sin. And so we need to understand that hindrance. Uh, Paul also warned here in uh, young Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, verses 9 and 10, but they that will be rich. Those that have a desire, a will, a desire to be rich, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Those that have that, that desire to have more can fall into a great deal of trouble because, verse 10, for the love of money, not money, but the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O oh man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, as he goes on to say. And, and so we, we have this warning that Paul gave to Timothy and to all of us uh, that God wants us to hear. That we need to be careful. We need to flee these things while some coveted after these things that it said there. The word coveted has to do with that idea that I said about greed. Unsatisfied desire to have more. Yet Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, He that loves silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loves abundance with increase. This is also vanity. It's empty. It's, a, it's unfulfilling. Those that have a desire to have more. I, I want more. If I had more things, if I had more money, I would be good. I would be satisfied. God says, nope. That's not the truth. Somebody else is whispering in your ear. Maybe your own flesh is speaking to you. That's not where contentment comes. Luke 12, 15, Jesus speaking about money said this, take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Beware of that desire to have more covetousness. Because just having more is not going to satisfy. 
That's not where contentment comes from. Concerning contentment, then, you back up a few verses there in, in 1 Timothy 6, 2 verse 6. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Hebrews 13, 5 says, let your conversation be without covetousness. The word conversation is not talking about your speech talking to other people, but it's your word is translated. Sometimes uh, we talk about your citizenship, your conduct as a citizen of heaven. Let your conduct be, the testimony of your character be without covetousness, without the love of money that can buy possessions. Let it be that. And be content with such things as you have. Gamblers are willing to take that chance, like I said, with one bird that they have in their hand, <clears throat> trying to get that two birds that's in the bush. And what they end up doing is losing the one bird that they had. person that plays the lottery you know what keeps them coming back they they win a little bit of money at one point they don't keep up with how much they throw it in there but it's that idea that man if I could just get that I would be so satisfied who are you going to believe Understand God's warning, Proverbs uh, 15 and verse 27, it says, He that is greedy of gain troubled his own house. It's not my opinion. It's God's word. He that is greedy troubleth his own house. Also concerning who do you love, Jesus made this statement. You remember what he said in, in Matthew 6, 24, uh, No man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. The word despise means to disregard. He's either going to love or hate. He's either going to listen to God or disregard God. You can't do both. You can't have two masters. Who's your master today, Christian? <coughs> Don't tell me. Show me. I told you before when witnessing to some people, when I feel like I have the, the uh, freedom to do so, uh, I'll ask them this question. When they, when they say to me, oh, yes, I, I trusted Christ as my Savior. I got saved when, you know, back when I was in VBS years ago. You know, but I know that their life is uh, they're not going to church anywhere. They're, they're living in sin. They're, you know, all of this is going on. And, and so when they tell me that, I look at them straight in the eye and I said, prove it. You say that you're saved, prove it. You know, they kind of look back at me, what are you talking about? Is there enough evidence in your life to convict you as being a Christian if other people are looking and evaluating? Or is it just because you say that you are? But remember what Jesus said, there are many that are going to say, Lord, Lord, haven't we? And I'm going to say unto them, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Because he says, I never knew you. <coughs> you were never genuinely saved. I wouldn't want to ever scare a genuine Christian into thinking they're not saved. Let me tell you something. I wouldn't want to preach to people in this church that came and heard me preach years and years and years and have them die and go to hell. I wouldn't want that either. There are a lot of good people. There are a lot of religious people that are in hell and that are going to be going to hell. Because it's not good and it's not religion that gets you to heaven. It's only a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that only comes as you realize your need, you realize what he did on Calvary to pay for the pen, your sins penalty, and by faith you make a choice to receive what he did as your payment and that's the only thing that you rely on. Amen. Not, I trust Christ and I'm trying to do the best I can. Not, I trusted Christ and I got baptized. Not, I trusted Christ and I'm giving faithfully into the offering plate. None of those things and is. You can't serve God and anything else. God and men. God and money. God and anything. It's only God.
Matthew 6, 21, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In other words, we can see where your love, your heart is by looking at where your treasure is, your checkbook, your credit card statement, what's important to you. It's not my opinion. That's what Jesus said. Our treasure, what we spend our money on, reveals our love, and gambling violates God's love principle. <coughs> Thirdly, ga gambling violates God's trust principle. <clears throat> in what or in whom do you trust? How many of you Christians today would say, I trust in God? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I would think every one of us would say that we trust in God. Can I make that statement again and say every one of us would say that we trust in God? Do you trust in riches or do you trust in God? Pastor, I trust in God. Do you trust in your own opinions of how to get riches or do you trust in God's way? Proverbs 3, 5 says what? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto your own understanding, your own way of thinking how that's going to work. Back here in 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 and 18, Paul told young Timothy, he said, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high minded, don't be proud. Because remember, who gave you the riches? nor trust in uncertain riches. <clears throat> Excuse me. What does the verse that say? Riches will, can grow wings and, and fly away. You've seen it probably. I've seen it. Uh, people that, that had plenty of money and plenty of possessions. <coughs> something happened and they lost it all. If we're trusting in riches, we're trusting in something that is shakable will not stand but don't trust in the uncertain riches but trust in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy we are to trust in the Lord not in the riches <clears throat> so who do you trust and I said before don't just say who you trust but show by your actions who do you trust gambling violates God's trust. And last, gambling violates God's, what I call, danger principle, his warning. <clears throat> There's a general principle. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. From all appearance of evil. What is that? It's if something looks like it's evil, it's sin. That means not from God. He knows exactly. So let's talk about other people. If other people will look at your life and say, hey, it looks like you're in sin. Well, that's something you maybe need to consider and say, Ooh, uh, I don't want to be doing something that may be misunderstood. I may not be doing anything wrong, but it may just look like I am. That's why years ago I told you I made a decision. I would never, um, when I was a youth pastor, I would never haul a teenage girl around in my car by myself. That's no, no. Not that I would be tempted or that something would happen, but somebody could look and see and suppose even. You have uh, two Christians, let's say. Hey, we're planning to get married in, in next year. Let's just go ahead and live together. We'll be disciplined and nothing will take place, but it'll be cheaper for us. We can save some money, so maybe we can buy a house a little bit quicker. Nothing is going to happen. Try telling that to your neighbor. What are the neighbor going to say? Yeah, right. The appearance of evil. Christian goes into a bar. They better not. I'm just going to drink some ginger ale. Don't you dare. Wrong place. 
I'm going to witness while I'm there. You better not. Don't you embarrass the Lord Jesus Christ that way. <clears throat> the appearance of evil. Anything that appears to be evil, to be sin, we need to abstain from. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Um, Paul told young Timothy again in 2 Timothy 2.22, flee also youthful <coughs> lust. Flee also youthful lust. You know, um, and I don't know if I gave you in the, in the stats there. Uh, somewhere I, I had it there. Ages uh, uh, 25 to 34 was the greatest percentile of people that were involved in betting uh, these days. Now, it doesn't mean that older people don't bet. Uh, they very well can, but the majority of them were in that younger uh, generations. Uh, flee youthful lust. Flee those things that uh, is, is that kind of a danger, temptation. Uh, any age can be temp tempted to gamble, but uh, the stats show that that's most vulnerable. Uh, most clear warning that I think in scripture is, is Proverbs 6, 27. It says, can a man take fire into his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can a man take fire into his bosom? Can you go and, and put on your, your, your asbestos gloves there and pick up those burning logs as, and still glowing hot and, and put them up in your arms and walk around and put them down somewhere else and it not burn your clothes, it not make your clothes smell like smoke? Can you do that? Obviously, the answer is no, you cannot. And in the context, uh, it has application there. But the principle that he's talking about can apply to a lot of different things. <clears throat> can I ignore, ignore God's warning in anything and it not affect me? And the answer is no, I cannot. <clears throat> if I ignore what God says in his warnings, it is going to affect me. So I ask you again, who do you listen to? You remember the first human sin in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. God had told Adam and Adam told Eve. God told them that they were not, they could eat of every tree that's in the garden. Every fruit, every vegetable, everything that was there was good for them. But for one tree, one fruit, they were not to partake of that. And what did the devil do in the form of the serpent? Came to Eve and he says, God said, did God really say that you, he's holding back from you? He don't want you to have the best. You're not going to surely die. That's what God had said. And so what did Eve and Adam do? Well, they rejected listening to God and what he had said, and they started listening to the serpent, the devil, what he was whispering. And they chose and ate of that forbidden fruit. And they died spiritually. And they began to die physically. God had told them the truth. They could not disregard God's warning and it not affect them. And it will affect you as well. But we as people inherently will follow the same mistakes as our ancestors did. When we don't listen to what God's word says, when the devil is saying, hey, that's for some of these that don't know what they're doing. That's for some of these that's so weak that they can't. I can stop anytime I want to. I can handle this. It's not going to affect me. I'm not going to waste my money on all of this kind of stuff. I'm in control. Did you hear him whispering that? 
So who, who are you going to listen to? I pray that no one in our church struggles or participates when it comes to gambling. But I'm not naive to think that it can't be happening. If you do, then treat that like any other sin. Repent, change your mind about continuing to do it, confess it unto the Lord that you've been doing it, receive his forgiveness, and then even get help if you need to. It's, in, it's like any other habit that becomes an addiction. It needs to be broken. If you're not struggling with that, I hope that, uh, that this information that I've given you this morning will help you to be able to talk to someone else that may be struggling. Because you may know somebody right now. Always remember, I have a little picture with his words on it. Ken Collier, um, former director up at the Wilds, Christian Camp, he said, there's just two choices on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. It simply comes down to that. So who do you want to please today? Don't tell me. Show me. Father, I pray that as we have listened to your word this morning, that we have heard you genuinely. And that we are willing to make sure, whether it's gambling or any other sin, that we would turn from that which is displeasing to you, that we would turn from that which affects us in a bad way and receive your forgiveness and the help that you can offer. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here that has never made that choice to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, that they would do so even today before they leave. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.